This is a lecture about the case Train versus Colorado Public Interest Research Group Incorporated or COPERG from 1976. This is a US Supreme Court case. And I'm making this video primarily for my statutory interpretation and regulation class or leg reg because it's in our case book. But students of administrative law might also find this um, interesting because it involves a regulatory agency and their interpretation of statutory terms. Now, for my students, why, why are we studying this old case? <clears throat> We're really learning about how the court um, uses or abuses legislative history when they're interpreting statutes. And so try to set aside the sort of um, idea that you could get in some of your first year law classes that all that matters when you're reading a case are the facts and the holding and um, the rationale of the holding and so forth, because actually that's not our purpose here. We're not concerned about gleaning a rule of law or looking at how the rule of law is applied. Instead, we're studying the the opinion almost as literature to see how courts use and unpack legislative history in the process of ascertaining the meaning of a statute and answering a specific question. And so the EPA wins this case, but that's not the point of the case and that's not why we're studying it. Um, the use of legislative history can be pretty unfamiliar to people before they get to law school, unless you worked as a paralegal and had to fetch the legislative history for the attorneys at your firm. And uh, so this, this case in particular is nice because the court is going to discuss different types of legislative history. Legislative history includes a lot of different um, documents produced at different stages in the legislative process. And this is a way to kind of get a glimpse at what those look like and what types of inferences a court will draw from them. Okay, so let's look at what happened in this case. And I'm just going to tell you enough about the facts and the law so that you we can really um, dive in and talk about the legislative history aspect of this. So the case really illustrates the court's frequent practice in the 1960s and 70s of focusing on the legislative history as the primary interpretive resource for determining the meaning of the statutory text itself. And if you've been watching, uh, reading the other cases in your book or watching my other videos, you know that um, the common law courts didn't use legislative history very much until, and we have this sort of big exception of the Holy Trinity Church case in the late 1800s. And then in the New Deal era, in the basically the 1930s and 40s, the court started using it, um, using legislative history, partly to because we just had so many more statutes and partly to give full force to the statutes that were being passed, the New Deal legislation. And then in the ensuing decades, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and a little bit in the early 80s, um, this became the norm, right? So it was assumed that um, the court was going to look at the legislative history and that this was very important. And in, in fact, a lot of times it mattered, the legislative history mattered more than the codified text of the statute itself. There was a pushback that we're going to look at in later cases than this. This is 1976 um, by the textualist movement, uh, as you know. Now, this case train also reflects the court's practice of sometimes equating the views of a sponsor of a bill or the originating committee in one of the houses of Congress with the intent or purpose of the Congress as a whole. In other words, we, when we get legislative history, it's a statement from either one legislator or a report produced by a subgroup of one of the uh, chambers. And to the extent that the court is drawing a lot of um, meaning from that, they're sort of projecting that onto the Congress as a whole and saying this is congressional intent. By the way, uh, just a quick word about our parties here. Um, this is not a case where like one aggrieved party is trying to get something from a wrongdoer or something like that. Train was the head of the EPA. He was actually, the EPA was a young agency at this point in the 1970s and Train was only the second director that they had ever had. Train's um, name is on a lot of the early environmental law cases from the 1970s 
because the statutes were new and were making their way through the courts for the first time. And so a lot of our big cases in environmental law um, that sort of set the parameters for our, our things like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, um, Train is listed as one of the parties. Coperg is a um, basically a conservation group and a, a kind of progressive politically. They advocate for other causes too, but at this time they were really advocating for the environment and um, it's, they're sort of environmental activists that are using litigation. And their goal here was to try to force the hand of the EPA. They wanted the EPA to regulate um, a particular type of pollution more aggressively. And the EPA was trying to stay out of this particular area. And so let's explain that. Our statute is the Federal Water Pollution Control Act or FWPCA. And that's what the court is interpreting in this case. You don't need to know everything about it. I'm just gonna tell you what you need to know for this case. This is our main statutory framework, sort of the early version of the clean, what we now call the Clean Water Act that, um, and it sets up a permitting system for discharges into um, water, in, into lakes and rivers and um, streams or the ocean and so forth. And these effluent limitations are enforced through this permitting system. As an aside, from an administrative or regulatory standpoint, this is one sort of approach to regulating an area. So let's say that you were uh, put on a panel to kind of regulate something, a social problem that's arisen from a, with a blank slate. One way to do that is to create a permitting or licensing system and then have a bunch of conditions for the permit or license because this is a way people have to apply for the permit or license and then they get, um, a, so the agency can collect a lot of information and it's easy to monitor and have people check in periodically to renew their permits and you have something to hold over people's heads and so forth. So this is a, a very common sort of, um, framework for regulating an area. And the all important trigger for a permit requirement is discharging some whatever is a pollutant. And so the statute <clears throat> has a definition section that defines pollutant, which is a term, again, that really matters because it essentially triggers the application of the statute to whatever you're doing. And here we go. The term pollutant means dredged spoil, solid waste, incinerator residue, sewage, garbage, sewage sludge, munitions, chemical waste, biological materials, radioactive materials. I put this in uh, emphasis because it's what we're talking about in this case. Heat, heat in itself can be pollution it, it discharged into water, wrecked or discarded equipment, rock, sand, cellar dirt, and industrial, municipal, and agricultural waste discharged into water. And I have the statutory section here. Now, <clears throat> what you uh, should notice here, of course, is Congress tried to make this all-inclusive. So they tried to cover all their bases here. But what the real problem and sticking point or issue in this case is radioactive materials. And this is what... Um, our plaintiffs, Coperg, wanted the EPA to regulate. They said, look, it's in your definition section, so um, why aren't you promulgating regulations? Well, that's the problem, is that the definition section doesn't have any caveats or qualifications for radioactive materials, but the EPA uh, promulgated a regulation basically saying they weren't going to regulate three major categories of radioactive materials um, and from the basically the Clean Out Water Act's coverage. And these are source material, special nuclear material, and byproduct material. So basically the EPA takes that statute that we looked at that includes radioactive materials and says, here's a bunch of things that we're basically going to say don't count as radioactive materials for purposes of this statute and our permitting program. But these are big categories. So 
these um, rate, why did they do this? Well, these radioactive materials were already regulated by another statute, very heavily regulated and closely, strictly monitored by an agency that already had this job, which at the time was the Atomic Energy Commission. We're gonna meet this agency in another part of the course, the Vermont Yankee uh, case, but, and they have since been replaced by what we call the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but the, um, at the time, we had a statute that already covered those three kind of big categories of radioactive materials, and it was another agency's job to regulate this. And in fact, as you can imagine, it's kind of their only job and, or their main job, and they specialized in this and had a lot of expertise with radioactive waste. So what the EPA was trying to do was a little bit to avoid a turf war with another agency, but also to avoid having um, duplicative or redundant or worse yet contradictory regulations from what the agent, the primary agency was already um, had in place for these types of radioactive materials. Now, here's the one of the confusing parts of the case. Um, the court decided without much explanation to review the EPA's position de novo. That's the standard of review that they used. Um, they still uphold the agency's position. Please note this is a 1976 case, so this predates Chevron. So we didn't even have Chevron deference yet. Today, a court would probably apply Chevron or at least have to explain why they're not. Um, but uh, the standard of review used is not uh, um, our purpose here. We're really focused on how they get to this, um, uh, uh, to their conclusion, which is they relied on the legislative history of this act and how we got that definition section. And they basically took the statements as deliberative. And this, uh, by the way, highlights um, a kind of a view of statutes as language that you should keep in mind and think about what your position is and then think about how you would argue this as a lawyer. So the court at the time treated statutory text as a form of communication and really looked at it and said the, the meaning is whatever the speaker or the writer intended. Now, if you took some literature classes in uh, college, you know that uh, this is, uh, there's other ways of thinking about, especially written text that we could sort of have a modern deconstructionist view that says the audience perception, the reader's perception might be just as valid as what the writer put down because once it's on the page, you give up control of it. But at the time in the 50s, 60s and 70s, Congress was really, and the courts especially, were really wedded to this idea that um, the meaning of what's in the code was what was intended by whoever wrote that law. And that so they would look at Congress and especially the, the bill's sponsor or drafter and the originating committee and so forth. And that's what we're gonna see in this case. But I also want you to recognize that this is, there's a little bit of a, a philosophical assumption here about the way language works and specifically written language and <clears throat> what words mean. That is a debatable point. So the court equated the meaning of radioactive materials with the understanding of some key legislators in Congress who basically framed the legislation. There was no reason to think, uh, like if you just read the statute and that's all you had, you would think that the EPA was supposed to include radioactive materials as a type of pollution for its permit system. And there was no indication that this was some sort of term of art, but the court gave it a specialized meaning from the legislative history and said it, it could only mean what the EPA says it doesn't mean, and which was everything except these huge big categories that were regulated under this other act. <clears throat> so remember um, when you were a kid and you watched these, um, uh, that cartoon, I'm just a bill sitting on Capitol Hill. When you have a bill proposed in the legislature, it doesn't go straight to floor debates on, on the House or Senate. It goes to a committee in each chamber and uh, usually a committee that sort of specializes in that area of, of governance and public policy. And that committee sort of 
works on the draft, tweaks it, edits it, holds hearings and debates, and eventually generates not only the form of the bill that's going to go to the floor of that chamber of Congress, but also a really big committee report that's usually hundreds or sometimes thousands of pages. And the, um, and it, which if you are not on the committee and you, you're in Congress and a law comes up um, for a vote and you wanna really get well informed and figure out what's everything that's going on with this, you could read the committee report. That would be a great source of uh, everything you wanted to know as if we think they, uh, anybody does that, but it's available if you really wanted to read it. So the House committee report that generated this statute and sent it to the floor for a vote um, said that radioactive materials are those not encompassed in the definition of source byproduct or special nuclear materials as defined by the Atomic Energy Act. So in fairness to the Environmental Protection Agency, they were doing exactly what the House committee that generated this law in the first place said. Um, to do, which is uh, we're not, not we're talking about radioactive materials that are not already regulated under this other statute and um, and carefully monitored and regulated by another agency under uh, because of that statute. Um, the second type of legislative history uh, to learn about from this case is this planned colloquy um, between Senator Pastore and Senator Muskie, uh, who I have pictured here from the time. Um, Muskie, Senator Muskie was actually the primary drafter of the bill. And um, so what is a colloquy? And the, by the way, this is a classic colloquy. That, so if you look at the excerpt in the case, it will introduce you to what this sort of looks like. Um, it's typically the sponsor of a bill or sometimes the floor manager, the person who's supposed to kind of take it, adopt it almost as the adopted sponsor and shepherd it through the, the floor debates. And, and then another person from their chamber, like a, in the Senate, it would be another senator. And it could be somebody from the own par their own party, or it could be um, somebody from the other party who wants, has some questions and wants some things clarified before they actually vote in their chamber. So a lot of times this is reassuring um, the senator and through this Q&A time, uh, question and answer time, the rest of the, that chamber, that certain like unintended consequences or hidden un uh, meanings and things like that won't ensue from the passage of the legislation. And it clarifies the intended meaning of the bill. And so from a, by the way, from a sort of nerdy congressional procedure standpoint, the other thing to know about a colloquy is these are scheduled a few days in advance and normally during floor debates in the Senate or House, all comments and questions and replies have to be addressed like to the Speaker of the House or their counterpart in the Senate. Um, and, the, um, and with the colloquy, you don't have to do that. The two can kind of take turns speaking just to each other. They don't have to direct their comments to the uh, um, Speaker of the House or whoever's presiding. And um, from a standpoint of legislative history for the courts, these are like gold, right? Sometimes because they, um, first of all, you get uh, somebody who really knows a lot about this and really cares about this bill talking. And so a lot of times floor debates, you get stray comments and by people, congressmen who are just grandstanding, who have no idea what the bill at law is even about. They just want to, um, uh, uh, change the subject or get off track or start talking about their pet issue or something like that. So this is usually um, meaningful. It's planned so they can actually sort of choose their words carefully ahead of time in their answers and questions and so forth. And a lot of times it, these are sort of meaty, like they address the very types of questions and issues that courts will later wrestle with during litigation. So planned colloquies are really useful for you as a lawyer to look at 
um, in defining the uh, definition of terms or the scope and application or reach of a statute. Um, the downside, of course, is that these are planned ahead of time so that they can there they could be a little bit contrived. Or if you have someone who has a hidden agenda or is really manipulative, they can schedule a colloquy and not be caught off guard by um, hard questions or things like that. Okay, the next type of legislative history here. Um, so we so far we've talked about the House Committee report that generated this statute, which basically said exactly what the EPA said. Then we have a colloquy that basically um, said what the EPA said, and now we have something that's sort of an inference from neg from a negative. During the floor debates in the House. Um, Representative Wolf, who's pictured here, um, introduced an amendment. He wanted to kind of change the language. And you can do this. You can sort of propose a spontaneous amendment to a statute that would have given states authority to have their own more stringent standards over radioactive waste than what the Atomic Energy Commission had. And, uh, um, and by the way, if you read this case, think about it in connection with the Vermont Yankee case from around the same time, you know that there was a lot of public concern and suspicion of nuclear power plants. And the idea was if some states really don't like nuclear power, um, they can have their own more stringent um, restrictions. But when this was floated in the House, everybody hated the idea, right? So this gets voted down. And the court draws a lot of inference from that. And I want, I find this type of legislative history very interesting because it's almost like we got to certify a question. And especially if it's a position that one of the litigants has already is, is proposing, it's like, you know what? Somebody actually brought that up, what you're saying during the debates and we they had a vote on it and it got voted down. So whatever else the statute might mean, we're sure Congress didn't mean that because they were asked, it's asked and answered. They were actually given a chance to vote on whether to put that right in um, during the floor debates and they said no. In fact, the court takes it one step further and they say, you know why they voted this down? Because they said the people who opposed this floor amendment said it would disturb the careful regulatory balance struck by that other statute, the Atomic um, Energy, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the Atomic Energy Act and the um, Atomic Energy Commission that was already regulating this, which again, very, kind of validates what the EPA is saying. There's another agency that regulates this the, the, there's another statute that already covered these types of regulatory materials. So the court then infers from the defeat, from the fact that the vote, th this amendment got voted down, that the reason that was stated for voting it down was what the majority of Congress actually thought. And therefore, they must have wanted to um, uh, have the AEC have exclusive authority over these radioactive wastes. Okay, last point, I promise we're almost done here. Um, the court gives a brief nod to some remarks in the conference committee, and I just want to explain what a conference committee is. Each House of Congress, the, the, the House of Representatives and the Senate, um, pass sometimes slightly different versions of the same law or act. So as it goes to the floor, um, the wording might be slightly different. It's not the, necessarily the same. After um, the law has passed both houses, it goes to a conference committee. And I have here a picture of a typical conference committee. It's a bunch of delegates from the Senate and the House that get together. And their whole job is basically to merge, or they would call it reconcile, the two versions of the bill, of the same bill that were passed. Usually it's almost always minor differences in some of the wording and punctuation and so forth. And so when it goes back, when once they come up with a merged version, it goes back to the House and Senate for a simple thumbs up or thumbs down approval of what the conference committee of their merged version of this or reconciled version is what they call it. Um, and there's no more debate, right? And so now 
here's the great thing about conference committee reports. It's the last word, right? This is the last bit of legislative history we're probably going to get before we actually vote on the bill. Uh, uh, like the, the final, in fact, we've already voted. And now the other thing that's nice about it is we have people from both houses of Congress and they are all focused on reconciling the wording. And so you from a court standpoint, this is great. It represents both houses of Congress. It's sort of the final word. So we know it didn't go through any more like big changes or amendments after this. On, on the other hand, remember that their whole job is just to reconcile the language and send it back and it's already been voted on. So these committee conference committee reports, even though they might be super reliable are often disappointing in how little they tell us about the intended meaning of words or with the goal of the statute or the reach of the statute or things like that. Um, so a lot of times there's nothing really there for a court to work with. But if there is, um, there's an argument for using it. Okay, here's our wrap up. At the height of its post New Deal embrace of legislative history, the court used the tools of construction to ascertain the intended meaning of a text. And they have no hesitation at all about using indicia of legislative intent to attach a previously unknown specialized meaning to a statutory term. And that concludes our lecture um, about train versus uh, Koperg. And again, remember, the whole reason you're reading this case was to learn about using and abusing legislative history.